This is Coda Radio, episode 275 for September 29th, 2017. And welcome to Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and science of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two wonderful sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. My name is Wes, filling in for the venerable Mr. Chris Fisher, and joining us, as always, is that ever so handsome host of the show, Mr. Michael Dominic. Welcome to the show, Mike. Misa back, you dirty mother Misas! Ooh, so dirty there. I was not prepared. But it's nice to be with you. How are you doing today? I am okay. I have survived hurricanes, gators, various retired Jedi to come to you today. That's impressive. I guess that's just what living in Florida must be like. That's uh, you know, not for the faint of heart. I just want to say, Dagobah in Florida... I'm not sure that George Lucas didn't just like have a title. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a one-to-one like, mapping right there. Uh, it, I mean, I had a snake in my pool this morning. Is that right? What kind of snake? Uh, he was black and big, and I got him the hell out of there. Yikes. That's not what you want to see in a sw- for a morning swim. So, so Florida plays a little fun game with you on snakes, Wes. Um, there are some black snakes. There's two types of black snake. One is harmless. In fact, he kills bugs and lizards. Oh, the friendly crack. snake. The other one looks almost identical, and one by its... Uh, you know, make peace with God. Ooh. Ooh. And how do you tell the difference? I don't. Okay, yeah, right. So all black snakes uh, just evil and get them get them right out of here. I, I, I try to be merciful because I assume they're not evil, but I do have running water behind my house, and I have had turtles come oh. up to my back door and visit me. Okay, that's adorable. Snakes. It's like all, all the reptilian creatures you might think of are coming to say... Good morning. Do you have a spare cup of coffee, Michael? <laughs> we'll have a morning chat. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So how are you, Mr. Wes? Oh, I'm doing wonderfully. It's uh, the first rainy day in quite a long time up here in the Pacific Northwest, so I'm just digging that. It's a perfect day for some podcasting. Every day is a perfect day for podcasting. Yeah, that's right. I guess we should get started. So uh, first up, do you want to wanna have some, we should visit some feedback, some hoopla? Yeah, let's hear them bitching again. All right. So it looks like uh, Anton shared with us a video by the creator of Django, the uh, Python web framework on FOSS burnout. Let's take a look at that, huh? Open source and feelings. My feelings are free, like my software. Like my software, yes. It is all meant to be free and wild roaming the simple planes in 2004 i was living in new york city um and basically was super unhappy i I, I had a shitty job was commuting an hour from new jersey i'd routinely fall asleep on my train on the way home which was the last train out of the city because i had a shitty job and i would routinely work till eight or nine um it it was just not it was not fun And and i spent most of my time actually kind of wishing i was back in college um the, the musical Avenue Q came out that year, and there's a piece at the beginning, uh, I wish I could go back to college, and like I broke down and cried when I went to see that. It was, it was pretty ridiculous. Wow. Um, and then I saw a job posting from uh, a couple people I barely knew um, looking for web developers in, in, in Kansas. And before I knew it, I was moving to a state I never thought I would live in, which I promise is not as bad as you think it is. Um, <laughs> well, the state, the state may be. Um, Lawrence, though, the town that I live there is, is beautiful. This is, this is South Park, the town in the middle. Right, well, we apparently get a lot of background here, but, uh, Foss Burnout, that definitely, that's something that needs to be talked about. I feel like we don't talk about it very much. Yeah, we got this last night, uh, or well, last week, rather, uh, regarding, uh, Foss, uh, developer burnout. It's a thing, right? I mean, there are a lot of developers, uh, particularly that listen to the show, that have been contributing to open source, yet just get their ass kicked right and left, right, by the either the uh, 
Oh, geez, Wes, bail me out. Uh, con- not contributor, maintainer. The maintainer of the project. Yes. Right. We can see this. I mean, the most dramatic version of this is, of course, the Linux kernel, where Linus will tell you to go F yourself if he doesn't like you. Yeah, just right. get out of there. Stay away because you will be hurt. Right. But you know what? I have to say it happens in... Um, uh, I don't know if you know this, Wes. A couple of years ago, I had a uh, old Objective C networking library called uh, MS MS uh, rather MDA networking. Okay. Not yeah. uh, MSDN. I want to fix that. MD networking. It was a replacement for ASI HTTP, which was deprecated uh, before AF networking, which is what they replaced it with, ever came out. Oh, interesting. And I made a horrible mistake, awful mistake. I put it as public. BSD licensed open source on GitHub. And all of a sudden, I got a pile of people demanding feature requests, complaining about like little edge case bugs. My library, all it did was, you know, put get post patch, right? Just the normal HTTP. Pretty simple, yeah. And folks were trying to use it for all kinds of crazy stuff. So what ended up happening? Wes, can you see the end of the story? Uh, you had a great community, you had a really nice relationship, you all learned a lot, and uh, happily ever after. Yes, but I'm from New Jersey, so... Oh, uh, right. Mm, mm-hmm. Now, I've since become a Southern gentleman, a little bit. You were, you were born to be, and you're, you're coming into your own. Much like Governor Chris Christie, I was born to run. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, to the beach. I, I told them all to go folk themselves. And I discontinued the project and appointed them to ASI, uh, or rather AF Networking. Yeah, okay. That, that, I mean, that's that seems appropriate. Well, it's a problem, though, if you think about it. I mean, and tell me I'm wrong, Wes, because you're more of a hippie than I am. But And I mean that in the most positive context? I would hope so. I mean, I did this thing for my own use, my own company's use, and then I released it under a a very permissive, right, BSD. How much more permissive can I get? Yeah, totally. Yet people are coming to me like, as as though they had paid me to build this and are demanding support. That's that's a tough pill to swallow, I think. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you're just trying to share uh, with the hope that, you know, maybe they will want to make improvements, um, refine it, or, you know, contribute back, which... You are saying sort of implicitly that you will do some sort of effort maybe to try to review patches. Uh, maybe you've stated that. I'm not sure. A lot of people do. Right. I um, did, yeah. If they can, if they conform to my... Uh, and I had a very, very common Objective-C style guide. Okay, it was an yeah. Objective-C library. Reasonable yeah. acceptance criteria. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, right. But that doesn't mean that you're there to, you know... It's one thing when you have a really large community maintained project that you know is a accepting feature requests and sort of like we have a large thing of uh, maintainers and contributors and uh, here's a room for ideas. But it's very different when it's like here's something I've made that you might find useful, and then a whole bunch, especially when the tone comes in and it's this implication that these are things that you need to be doing or what you've done is wrong or incomplete or right. just not good enough. Right. And in many ways, what I had done was actually incomplete, I feel. And I'm using myself as an example here, Wes, because I don't want to single out other open source packages because it seems wrong. Sure, right. right. We can just talk but, about you and your failings. And we, exactly. I mean, sh- hang on. Can we dial in my wife? Because she has a lot to oh, say. Oh, yeah. We've got a we've got an expert <laughs> panel here. We'll bring them right uh, in. Yeah. Um, you know, all I wrote was a put, get, post, patch library, right? HTTP, the standard HTTP interface. Yep. What other people wanted was an S3 interface or a, um, oh. I don't know if you remember this, but the, uh, not Minio, what's before Minio, the Jungle Disk? Do you remember Jungle Disk oh, at all? Oh, yeah, very, I, I didn't actually use it, but I'd read about it. I had a very small but vocal contingency that would send me GitHub uh, emails or GitHub whatever issues complaining that oh you don't support jungle disk oh my gosh really Dude, no <laughs> i don't like this is a this is an http library sorry bud like, yeah, right if you want right. to write an adapter to do that then uh, have at it and if you follow my style guide i will take it yeah like, right that, exactly that's totally fine um so i have a lot of sympathy for the python folks here and this is a comment we got a couple weeks ago too about um open source contributions are having a little bit of an issue where contributors are 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 starting to get frustrated, Wes. They're starting to get 
I don't want to say their feelings hurt, but they're getting a little offended that they're working for free and people are, are talking to them or, or treating them rudely. Mm-hmm. I, I, maybe, maybe you have some insight here better than I do. You, you know, no, I mean, I think, I think so. it just, it's, you, you know, it, it's always somewhat raw when you're putting yourself out there. We live in a, a critical world, a critical culture in many ways, which is good, right? We want, we want constructive criticism. We want to refine our ideas and work together to make things, um, especially in the open source world. Uh, so I think it's just, it's, it's complicated by a lot of the same problems we have in general communicating over the internet. You know, you don't have faces to people. You don't really know them. You're talking over a text medium most of the time. Um, and then you have one side who has, you know, maybe something they care about. Maybe it's like something in your case where you're just kind of throwing it over the wall to be helpful. Maybe it's something that people are pouring their heart and soul into. And in either case, it's something that you're taking the risk and, um, you know, putting a little piece of yourself out there on the internet for, for the world to see. And, when other people come by and maybe not even mean it, I guess there, we could, we could talk more about like what, how much legitimate malice is there in the community or legitimate entitlement. Um, but even just the perception of that or without, you know, comments or suggestions of things that don't really take into account, don't, aren't polite enough, don't think, or don't just engage in a, don't go a little extra step to be positive. I could see that being, you know, really wearing down on someone, especially when a lot of people that are in open source, you you have a different day job, you have stuff that's totally unrelated. This is just like a little piece of your life that you're trying to do a positive thing. So at what point, I mean, that's a great question. I I know you don't mean to bring it up now, but that, that is really a great question, right? At what point does a user of an open source license actually have a valid claim yeah in terms of like demanding something from the maintainer that's a good that's a good question i mean i I guess it has to be it depends on how it was set up because i could see some like especially bigger projects or others you know like some sort of stated guarantees um or at least approximate guarantees especially for the sake of adoption right like we may we uh insist that we won't have breaking changes outside of you know or like we will follow semver or whatever some sort of contract around like you're trusting our library so here's a relationship you can have i think in that arena totally valid to be like you guys really broke this and i ended up shipping a production and it broke my things and sure i should have been able to catch that but Based on your history, this was errant, and I feel wronged or something. I think there's some definite grounds there. Right, but, but, but what's the recourse, right? So in that case, if, if it's errant and you feel wrong, I mean, you can't fire the maintainer. <laughs> no, right? right? Yeah, exactly. Project. Like, you're in his house. You don't like the, you don't like the beer. Get out. Yeah, right. you have to either, like, go with a competitor if there is one in that right. space, or, like, I think what you're trying to, what you're really point out here is like or you're still, still gonna have to have a constructive relationship with these people if you're going to keep relying on their software and if you're you know especially if you're relying on for business like that's you you are heavily reliant on it i mean this this reminds me a lot of somebody just slapped me from my own company about you know church volunteers like people complain about the volunteers but like it's hard to actually do anything because you know they volunteered and you didn't um or podcasters right like or podcasters how can you, at, at some point, it's free, right? It's, no one's making a fortune on podcasts except for Adam Carolla. <laughs> yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, it's just something you're putting out in the world and you want to make it better and you want to make it meet what the audience wants so that everyone's having a good time. Uh, but you also, you know, th- there's realistic constraints that you have to deal with. So I don't know, like, what are what what can people do or think about or be cognizant of when interacting with open source projects that can maybe maybe prevent some of these bad situations from happening? What would you have liked to see from some of the people that you know that did things that didn't go well in your experience? You know, for me, it was the whole way GitHub works that everything's public and the very what I found hostile slash condescending comments and issues like, you know, you don't support AWS. Well. It's an HTTP library. AWS is like not HTTP, <laughs> right? Yeah, they have their S3, own weird own API. Protocol. Yeah, right. Like it's not what this does, but you want it to do that. You can fork it, right? You can you can do it your own way. Um, I I don't know, right? Because there's something insulting about like 
and this happens even when bidding contracts. Like the internal IT people will say, "Oh, we could get this feature done in you know in a weekend, in in like a day and a half." Yes, and it's never true, right? When you when you're not the person demanding the feature, it always seems much smaller than it actually is. In my opinion. Yeah. No. You're. Yeah. That's that. I think. I think you're right about that. That's kind of. I hadn't thought about it in that, in that way before. But. Uh, hmm. Well, I'm sorry that that things like, that your project went that way. Do you have? Have you had better? Do you have other open source experiences that have been better? Uh. No. Not really. Yeah. That's too bad. Yeah. We keep everything proprietary now. Hmm. Yeah. So it wasn't. Worth it. Yeah, yeah. Right. It, it wasn't worth it. It was. Um. I mean, people used it. We know that people used it, and they used it to bid contracts against us, which is annoying. Which is super so, annoying. So you're just setting up your competitors at this point, right? So we it wasn't worth it. Like we thought it would be a marketing thing, and it just yeah no. Yeah. So how does that? I wonder what the the like economic dynamics there are, right? Like sometimes it can be useful, as we've seen maybe like with Linux or other things, where you know people that nominally compete, it still makes sense to share a certain amount of like base infrastructure that's not necessarily your value add layer. Um, you know, versus like when is it just no, I don't want to help them at all and they won't, you know, I don't trust that yeah. they would ever help me, so I'm just gonna lock I, it all down. I think a good line or the line that I found is anything that's like system infrastructure mm-hmm. should be open source. Anything application layer ought to be proprietary. Yeah, and I think we kind of see that a lot of times in licensing too. I mean, sure, there are like you know there are BSD license operating systems and other things, but there's a lot of a lot of GPL at the system layer, but there's a lot more MIT or BSD kind of at the application library layer, at least in the languages right, I right. tend to use. I suppose yeah, that's, same thing. I suppose that's yeah. a net natural segue into uh, into the next topic we wanted to talk about today, which is the relicensing of React. Uh, Jest, Flow, and Immutable.js by Facebook, which some people were quite surprised by given their earlier stands and all the commotion about their previous BSD plus patents license. You know what? I'm going to say this. I think Zuck saw the light in the way, and he is in much better shape now. Is that right? You have faith in the reformation of Zuck. I, I believe that there are prophets among us Ooh. at this point. So you see this going? Do you see other projects falling under this umbrella of relicensing? This is... I'm looking at you, Satya. This is the way. Use an established open source license that's been trial tested, or at least, you know, relatively accepted, like MIT or BSD. Yeah, definitely. Don't don't make your own funny license. Don't try to have patent clauses. If you want to be open source, be open source. And if you don't, don't. Like, you know, I've been... I mean, Wes, I don't know if you listen, but I've been getting a lot of crap about my shilling for System76. I like I my... do listen, but I didn't know you were getting crap about that. Wow. I'm getting a ton of crap about it for my Lemoore, and I recently got a Galago Pro. Oh, you know, you're a commercial. I'm not really a commercial, right? Like, I will whip up a MacBook faster than you can say. <laughs> Tim Cook looks very pretty today. You've probably already uh, bought one today while we were talking. And I actually show. did buy a new 15-inch MacBook for about three thousand dollars. What? Oh my! I was like going to say that, but Ooh. it is what I'm talking to on now. And I, I'm I ask not. you deliver. This is incredible. I love it. Yeah, it's uh. Well, let's look at some specs. You did this to yourself, Wes. You did this to yourself. I sure did. I can't help right, myself. So it is uh, 500 gig SSD, 16 gigs RAM, and a four gig radeon card oh right. nice yeah. yeah and i did it because i had to i was gonna say so yeah what you had to what are the motivating factors here not I that you a, need any necessarily I but. A native project that had to get done and i had to pass oh. down my macbook pro to a new hire right that was involved when you got the galago right yeah so the lemur went to a higher the galago went to a higher or rather the uh macbook pro went to a higher so right now I'm a MacBook Pro 15 and a Galago 13 guy. Hey, that's so a pretty nice setup. Nothing to shake a finger at. I think so, but yeah. Uh, so how much? How does that? Do you resent at all that you have to go make this expensive purchase to be able to pursue this project, or is it just uh, is it or is it like not consequential enough? You can get enough other uses out of this equipment that it doesn't really matter. So there's a dirty little secret here, right? Like, if I just, like, gave up on Linux, I could probably be perfectly fine in Mac. Mm, yeah. 
Because there's nothing that Linux can do that Mac can't. Mm -hmm. Right? It really does go the other way, where you can't do iOS on Linux. Yeah, exactly. Well. But you can do everything on Mac. You might have to make some concessions. Like, you're living in homebrew, you're, you know, which is a, if you don't know, for folks who are not who are not Mac people, homebrew is like apt-get for Mac, right? Um, but it basically works in the most boring sort of Anglican church sort of way. Um, yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, it, there's something wrong with it, right? It's hard, I mean, it costs a ton of money, but once you buy it, you've bought it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. It's not, uh, you know, Apple doesn't play a lot of games with having to keep I mean, buying licenses I, or other things, so... But Wes, I would like to say it's not connected to a 4K LG Apple monitor right now. Ooh, uh, I, mean, I want, I, I want would, one. I would like to say that. Yeah, but you can't because uh, you're a traitor and we hate you, Mike. We hate you. I, I would say that I am on both sides. Yeah. Hmm. You know, all I wanted was peace, and Anakin Skywalker cut me in half at the end of Episode Three. That's what happens to the to the good guys. I'm afraid. They the Trade win. Federation were the good guys. That's an interesting point of view. Well, I mean, better, better than, better than some. No, but all kidding aside, one problem developers have today, I feel, is that these platform vendors are trying to lock you in, and I firmly don't believe that having two computers makes sense. I just don't. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. You have to constantly switch. Suddenly, you're syncing files or managing state between these two machines. It's nonsense. Right. I also believe that, like, Pop! OS or more, more uh, maybe a less, because uh, that, that's what people got me for, Wes. They don't like Pop. But a more uh, acceptable opinion is that Ubuntu uh, 18.4 is going to be good. Right. The uh, but, next LTS with the GNOME desktop and all that exactly. jazz. But there are some hardcore limitations on if someone wants to pay you to do an iOS project, you're sunk. Yeah, right? right, yeah. You're like, yes, I do want your money, so uh, I'll get started. Right. It's it, it, it's a problem. And also, Wes, I love you. Oh, I love you. I sent something oh. coming here. Something's coming here. I'm not prepared for it. I think it's time that we all switched to OS2. OS2. Let's bring it back, ladies and gentlemen. OS2 is coming back to a computer near you. What's your favorite part about OS2? I knew you were going to ask that, and I have no answer. You have no answer? I used OS2 once, and I don't remember. <laughs> uh, yes. I remember thinking, shit, this sucks compared to Windows. That's yeah, it's, I mean, it's great. Basic system calls were modeled after MS-DOS calls. Uh, OS2 shares a lot of similarities with Unix and Xenix and Windows NT. Pretty sweet. Check out this uh, awesome Warp desktop we've got. Yeah. Uh, you can play 3D chess. This is going to be our worst episode ever. I love it. Yeah, this is terrible. Uh, I mean, OS2 is hilarious, and I love that that's something that you think about. You know what I still think about, though? Small talk. Oh, yeah. Small I know talk. this wasn't in the show notes, but I've been writing small talk, believe what? it or not. Is that right? Uh, Wes, I'm a notorious alcoholic, but yes, I've been writing small talk. <laughs> That's amazing. So, what inspired you? You've just been like reading a bunch of Alan Kay's writings, or actually, yes, you, you you were teasing me, but you got it. You actually got that it. That is incredible. Oh man. Okay, so tell us more. What what so, what brought this about? All right. All right. I'm a well-known Objective C file, right? I yes. love Objective C. I wake up in the morning wishing my wife was Objective C or Alan Kay. I'll take it either way. Mm -hmm. um, Small talk is like the daddy of Objective C or the mama, as I think it is. It's a very sort of female feeling to it. Mm -hmm. It is, in my opinion, are you ready? Oh, yeah. The perfect programming language. The next best thing is Objective C. In every way is it perfect. The debugger. In fact, let's get this out. Let's put this in the show notes. There is an open source project keeping small talk alive. Is it Squawk? I think it might be a Squawk. I think it's Squeak. Here we go. Squeak. There we go. Yeah, squeak.org, everyone. It's the open source small talk programming right? system. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go on. No, there's a few others, but Squeak is probably the most popular. Uh, but you can actually write and compile small talk in almost any system today. That's incredible. In like less than a meg of RAM. Because yay, small talk. 
So for people, okay, so if we have viewers that don't know about small tech, which we very well might because it's it's been a while, do you have like a rundown of what small tech is, why someone might want to use it, how it's different than Objective C or systems they might know? Um, ooh, that's a question. This is an so, interview now, um, so just so you know. Yeah, that's fine. So small interviewing an insane person. This is like before ooh, the execution. Mm. Um, small talk is like Objective C if it weren't corrupted by C. Right, if it didn't have the procedural garbage brought yeah. to it by the C language. Okay. I like that. That's a great description. In, in reality, what that means is that everything's an object, right? So the debugger itself, and this is kind of crazy for people to jump onto if they're used to like a JavaScript environment, but the debugger itself is an object that you can uh, interact with, which is, if once you embrace it, it's almost like opium. Once you embrace it, it will change your life. I see it kind of as like, uh, you know, like if you're doing like a functional style, you've got, you know, suddenly functions become first class. You can talk to them. You can, you know, reason about them like anything else. feels like that's the way, you know, objects are there. Objects and message passing become first yeah, class. In, in, and in a way, hidden. right. I mean, people are going to email in, but I, I would argue that in a way, in small talk, everything is first class, right? Yeah. Right. There is no such thing as a you know, a raw type or a second class kind of value. I've also, I, I feel like, yeah, no, go I, ahead. no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, I, and it's also important, I think, to emphasize, like, it's, you know, it's a very interactive system. You're in this, you know, you're in this environment where you, you have your, like, it's almost like its own, it's an IDE, it's got a debugger, it's a whole environment, but you can interact with it in, like, all the ways you want. So not necessarily, like, writing a plugin for IntelliJ, you are, like, building and shaping the environment that you're in. And I feel like that's, uh, no, that's something that's... that's I mean, it, small talk is its own environment, right? You don't need IntelliJ. You don't need... Right. God forbid Visual Studio. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I have nothing else to say other than if you can't use small talk, Objective-C is the next best thing. Yeah, okay. Um, and people might want to just study small talk, uh, you know, just to learn a lot of some of the a lot of the patterns and practices that we use in modern uh, object oriented programming uh, were influenced by small talk. So it's definitely worth a check out. And I've only, I have not tried Squeak, but I've heard only good things about it. So it sounds like you're having fun too. Yeah, I feel like there's a a renaissance about to happen. A Actually, renaissance. I don't feel that at all. <laughs> renaissance. Uh, I was gonna say, do you really feel that? But no, clearly, clearly not. No, I feel like me and all the other old fogey objective scene small talk guys are gonna go into the West one day. Into the all West. the Swift hippies will take over. All the vertical s- oriented programming. Oh, it's so much better. We're gonna make the same mistakes over and over again, but we're gonna make it so much more complicated with optionals. <laughs> I think that is, is that-, that is the trend these days. Yes, just make it more com- complicated with optionals. I hate optionals. Optionals are stupid and you shouldn't have them. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so getting us back on track, did you have anything you want to say more about the relicensing of React? I think it's a good idea, right? I mean, I, I know from my own sales experience, uh, you know, all kidding aside about small talk and all our kind of crap here, that enterprises won't buy React development because of the patent license, right? Mm-hmm. Their general position is we reserve the right to sue anyone for anything, period. <laughs> right, yeah, of course. So that was a problem. Going under the MIT license, which I think it is, right, Wes? It's MIT now? Uh, yes, it is. That that basically, you know what? I've been doing Angular and a little bit of Vue.js. Oh, Vue, I nice, s- yeah. A little bit of Vue. I, s- I think Angular is going to pay a hefty price for this. Um Oh, do you? React, you see this? You see this extended yeah. React's influence now? Because um, Angular's well, also yeah. MIT, right? I, it is, but Angular shot themselves in the foot with the most recent version. Uh, they broke compatibility. They changed the entire programming landscape for Angular. It's really not compatible. You can't go from Angular one to four. That sounds like a big jump. Except Angular three is almost like Windows nine. It doesn't fucking exist. Is that right? So, yeah, it's they. They had a little change of heart right in the middle there. Right, and they adopted TypeScript as well, right? Yeah, which TypeScript is actually, ironically, TypeScript as a language is more interoperable with JavaScript than Angular 1 is with Angular 4. Wow, okay. So, so yeah, that's, the, yeah, that's not the issue, it's just that... Uh, yeah. The issue is they made some philosophical changes. I um, see. I, I don't see a reason not to use React now. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the license is sane. 
Um, I still have issues with the idea of a Shadow Dom, but View has a Shadow Dom as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the market wants Shadow Dom. This is my putting on my CNBC hat for a no. moment. Yes, please do. Give, sell the people what they want, right? Sell That's what the they people want. what they want. Yeah, exactly. I think the thing I, li I like about it uh, is the... Uh, I, I almost exclusively use React from the, uh, like, Clojure script side of things, um, where React is pretty popular because of the, the Shadow DOM implementation, um, so that it just, you know, it plays nicely with immutable objects, um, part, partly why Facebook has immutable JS. Uh, and so the idea that you can just sort of, you know, have this object, you present it, uh, and then React handles all the management underneath to make sure that what you have is always reflected on the page just works really nicely for the kind of workflows that I've been using. Um, but I, I, I struggled to see, I was never really into it from the JavaScript side. Like I never cared for JSX. It seemed really like really oop and just kind of convoluted. Uh, so ClojureScript has shown me a much simpler side because they, all they really care about is that one function, you know, that you just have like some data and then your view is like a function on the data and they're really into one way data flows, kind of like the Elm architecture. Uh, so it's really just a library from that case. I don't necessarily jump in with the whole React Redux architecture on the JavaScript side. You know, I still don't know that there's a good reason for the Shadow DOM to exist, but I feel the same way about Xamarin, to be honest with you. This doesn't need to exist, but it does. Mm -hmm. And people want to pay for it, so... So you're there to sell it to them, at least now that it has a sane license. That's right. Ah, excellent. Okay, well, I think that's a perfect time to take a break and talk to our f about our first sponsor this evening, which is our dear friends over at DigitalOcean.com. If you want to go run some software projects of uh, whatever license that you whatever license you'd like. DigitalOcean is just about the perfect place to do it. In under 55 seconds, you can spin up a droplet, which is a cloud VPS of your very own. And prices start at just $5 a month. If you use our super special promo code, code or digital, then you'll get a $10 credit. So uh, go sign up, make a new account. Then you can enter that promo code, code or digital. That'll get you your $10 credit, and you can spin up whatever rig you want. Container Linux, you're going to you're gonna get full on, try to make yourself a K Kubernetes cluster. Do it. DigitalOcean is a great place to play with that. Maybe you've heard about all the cool new features DigitalOcean's been rolling out, things like cloud firewalls. You don't have to be an IP tables expert. Monitoring built right in. Don't have to spin up your own Nagios. Man, this just gets better and better. Plus, they've got uh, load balancers. They've got private networking, so if you do make yourself a cluster, communication in the same data center between your droplets, boom, you don't pay for that. Just one of the ways DigitalOcean makes it so much simpler, so much easier, and they've got an incredible web dashboard built on an even more incredible API. It's not like the API of some of those competitors that maybe you've used. It gives you just giant, ugly, horrible JSON blobs. You hate working with it. It's a pain. You have a thousand wrappers around it. DigitalOcean, it's same from the get-go. And it still has a bunch of wrappers, community projects, integration with all your favorite tools, things like Terraform, Vagrant, etc. So you can use it just the same. And just this month, they've now released Spaces, which is an S3 compatible object storage platform. So uh, they've already had black block storage on all SSDs. Now they've got object storage, pretty much anything you need to build uh, whatever you want on the cloud. So if you haven't already tried, head on over to DigitalOcean.com, use our promo code, code or digital, and get yourself a brand new droplet in the cloud and thank you very much DigitalOcean for sponsoring Coda Radio ah nothing like a few droplets I don't know what I'd do without them that's true yeah okay so we were speaking just a little bit about your new purchase I bet you nope. hmm didn't happen didn't... I was all on vacation ah vacation wow that's a shame. Go ahead. Hit uh, me with it. You don't want to wait till episode two? We have we have three to do. You don't want to nail me on episode two? Oh, yeah. No, you're right. That's true. That's true. Um, okay. Two is the Apple one. You may as well get me. Yeah, that's true. Wait, I'm confused. Two is the Apple? I thought this was the Apple one. No, I thought this was the React one. Oh, yeah. Well, it certainly can be. Okay, I guess I switched those up. Woohoo! That's my mistake. That's my bad. 
No, no, not because at all. I'm using a Mac. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. You are using a you are using a Mac. Yeah, okay, listen. I was in college. Uh, I needed the money. Well, that's actually what happened. Is that right? That's exactly true. Actually, you were in college. You needed the money. You started doing Mac uh, development work. You know, it all began with that first open square bracket, right? And then I couldn't turn back. That first open square bracket. Yeah, that's terrifying. And if you know Object C, you get that joke. <laughs> Otherwise, you think I'm going crazy on the air again. I think you are wow. going crazy on the air. That's all. That's what you do. That's why everyone loves you, Mr. Dominic. That does explain the YouTube comments. Yeah, I think I think you're right about that. Yeah. All right. So yeah, no React is. Um... So here's my question, though. Yes. And this wasn't clear on the blog post. Is it React JS, React, and React Native, or is it just React? So far, it I, I know I know it's definitely not React Native um, because a lot of people have that's a, yeah because that's a about pretty that. that's pretty substantial though right because React Native is is quickly uh, you know I I love my Ionic but React Native is basically eating Ionic's lunch. Yes, definitely. It yeah. seems to be. It's yeah. It's, I'm surprised it's picked up quite a bit uh, right off the get go. You know, Ionic, again, shot themselves in the foot by following Angular. Ionic 2 is a breaking change from Ionic 1, which makes no goddamn sense. So what do they do? They kept supporting Ionic 1, because that just makes sense. Because right? that's People, what everyone's doing, right. Right, because no one wants to break, sell something to a client and then tell them six months later, oh, all that shit doesn't work anymore, sorry, bro. Like, come on. What yeah. are we in the tech industry? Yeah, right. Come exactly. On. I mean, like breaking changes are always super terrible. If you can go in a way where you have an evolutionary approach, that's always easier for end users. Um, or you have to be really careful and you know not commit to that stable API until you're actually ready to call it stable. Well, which is, I think, the real problem with Angular. They they saw a lot of performance increases because uh, for those who don't know, Ionic is actually built on Angular, right? So the reason Ionic did what it did is because Angular did a breaking change. So it's, it's a little unfair to blame the Ionic guys for this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So how does, um, tell me more about, I have not used Ionic personally. So, so Ionic is a, is, is a tasty, tasty milkshake. It's almost like a uh, parfait. Ooh. Multiple, multiple layers of flavor here. You have iOS and Android at the, at the dirty bottom of the glass. Mm -hmm. Really? If you think about a 1950s milkshake glass, that's where iOS and Android are living. On top of that, you have Cordova. Do you remember Cordova? Yeah. Oh, man, that's bringing back memories. We're bringing it back, baby. On top of that, you have um, AngularJS, which in some hot hipster circles is now called Angular 1 or Angular Classic. And it's only two years, three years old. Yeah, right. Oh, five. man, that's Angular Legacy. What are you doing, yeah, Greybeard? That, that's, you know what? I was just at a startup event, and I said... A guy looked at me like, yeah, well, all the younger people. I'm like, bitch, I'm not 30. What are you doing here? Ouch. Like, it was a bad time. That's a horrible uh, time. Don't worry, you're as handsome as ever. You know, you say that, but I'm seeing a lot of lot of lines and a lot of black circles, Wes. I mean, I think you're playing me for a fool here. You're sweet-talking me, and I'm going to cry. Hey, is it working? That's all that matters. Not really. Ah, okay, I'm going to try harder. Anyway, yeah. So you've got so Cordova on is, there. Yeah, you've got Cordova, and Adobe has done a good job of abandoning Cordova. Yes. They've really top shelf normal Adobe behavior. They've said, "Meh, whatever." Huh. Um, Ionic, however, had a divorce, and divorce is you know my heart to anybody who's been divorced. They're nasty. Uh, another project between the Ionic 1 and Ionic 2 called Aurelia. Are you familiar with this at all, Wes? I'm not. Aurelia is the the divorced son of Ionic 1 going to Ionic 2, or at some point maybe after Ionic 2. The dates are a little fuzzy because it's all on message boards and like email chains. So who knows when exactly they did it. But it's it's in that in that chasm, right? In that delta between Ionic 1 and Ionic 2. Okay, I see. Aurelia is is kind of doubling down on the Ionic promise, but they're a much smaller project. Ionic is following Angular pretty closely, and that presents a problem if you're selling an enterprise mobile application. 
because there's no compatibility, right? Right. Yeah, that is a that is a big problem. So let's just say, for example, you had an Ionic One app from a couple years ago, and all of a sudden you upgrade to Ionic Two and you try to run it. The answer to that is tears. You cry because you have uh, at least t- thirty to forty hours of retooling to do. Ooh, wow. So the Ionic Project's response to this, insanely enough, after all their marketing and all their blogging and all their videos about how awesome Ionic 2 was and it's not that hard to transition and guys, you guys are being little bitches, just do it, was to now support Ionic 1 for basically ever as a separate project. So now Ionic 1 is in the Ionic house, so to speak, but it's like the weird uncle on the side. The sad part is, and and this might be my enterprise bias now, in the enterprise space, people are just using Ionic 1 because they okay. they commissioned these projects years ago yep. and no one's going to rebudget, right? No one, no one's it's just not going to happen. I mean, I you know, part and this is not meant to be the anti-Ionic show. I love Ionic. <laughs> but part of the reason people like me pick I, picked Ionic over Aurelia was Ionic was just the, the the adult in the room, right? Don't never never have breaking API changes, and 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 this even goes to Angular. Yo, oh, it's been five years. Who cares? Yeah, five years is nothing to an enterprise. Yeah, it really isn't. Um, it really isn't. Like that's that is not an excuse. No yeah. breaking changes. I've heard uh, you know some suggestions to people that like you know if you're really going to have breaking changes, maybe it's time to just pick a new name. You know, is this a new project at that point? Right, exactly. And that might just make branding more clear. You don't get the kind of confusion over, well, oh, yeah, it's just an upgrade. Angular, between Angular 1 and Angular 4, it is a new project. They are, they are so different that it doesn't matter. And I want to advise you, there is no Angular 3. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's even more confusing. Three, it just wasn't, it wasn't a big enough change. We had to jump right over it. Right, well, well 3 is like Windows 9. It got shot in the back of the head. Mm-hmm. It's... I'm sure it was a horrible abomination that we didn't want to see anyway. So I guess that's not so bad. Uh, do you do you enjoy? Have you done much Angular four? No. Okay. I was gonna say like, is it, I, I are these improvements to, worth it? Okay, so you switched uh, to Vue. Yeah, I, I couldn't take it, but I'm probably gonna. I'm, and I've been doing some React. I'm probably gonna end up falling on React because the only reason I didn't do React was the license. Mm, okay. So. Uh, I, I think this could end up being a React kind of hegem- or, uh, homogeny situation. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Vue.js, Vue. uh, it seems to be gaining a lot of popularity. I think when the controversy, when uh, you know, the Apache lawyers were bringing up, first bringing up concerns, when WordPress was bringing up concerns with the BSD plus patents license on React, I think Vue.js uh, and a couple other ones, things like Preact and others, it really got a lot more attention that they had. I'd already seen Vue being talked about a lot, but uh, have you had a good experience using it? Is something you'd, you say you're going to probably end up at React. Is that just for Mindshare, or is Vue not meeting your needs? Uh, I think Vue is great. I mean, if it was a pure technological slash API decision, I would probably go with Vue. But the market seems to want React. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that ever held back any clients I've had and this is actually a sales pitch, right? Against React was the license. <laughs> right. So with that, with that impediment gone, I don't. I, I honestly, other. This is the U.S. market, because right? I know Vue is super popular in Asia. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know how React doesn't just plow over Angular, except for you know legacy stuff, right? People support Angular or whatever. Um, I, I don't. I mean, Facebook has the money; they have the talent. There's no way they lose this war. Right, they have a huge. They have a huge number of people actually working on it, using it. They use it. Like I see, you know, Google has some use, but it feels like it's well, not the, the same fact, kind of relationship. Right, and the fact that I had to go into sales conversations and bring up a license on an open source project as a way to defeat another vendor, that shows you that without that license, I would have lost all those. Right. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose there is that too, right? Like if, if React is the dominant one, then companies want to be able to do that. It's easier to find more vendors that they can have compete against each right. other, or it's easier to hire exactly. people to work on those projects. Exactly. Yeah. And enterprises are naturally conservative, right? So yeah. they, 
they don't want to be on the bleeding edge. They want to be with the most common solution. It's just really funny to me that React is now like considered the enterprise safe world because just a few years ago it was like this weird new thing Facebook dropped in the world. But I guess at the speed of JavaScript, it's been a long time. It's sort of a different world that we have to live in, in the, when you have a new framework every, well, two minutes. I think there's a new one right now that we should be checking out and reviewing probably. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so have you done React before? Have you shipped anything that was based yeah, on React? Yeah, I've done, I've done some React. I mean, I've done some React Native. Uh, to be honest, for me, React Native is, is kind of a lot more interesting than React. Mm -hmm. um, just because the cost curve on app development for double native. I still feel, I mean, Xamarin's great, but I still feel there's some significant issues in Xamarin that ought to be addressed. And I feel like fundamentally can't be in terms of cost of development. Oh, yeah. Which is a long, boring conversation that I'm not sure that we really want to have. But React Native basically solves most of those problems, except for that goddamn license, right? That, that, that's where it all falls apart. That's where it falls apart. Uh, yeah, it really seemed like they stepped in it by bringing up patents at all. Um, just like software patents are such a crazy, horrible, messed up, no good, very bad time uh, that like when, you, when you're just MIT everyone doesn't have to think about it, right? Like, yeah, okay, right. maybe maybe Google has some patents on Angular that we don't know about and that they could possibly see you with, but if no one talks about it, no one brings it up, and we can all just go on our happy way and use open source software. And here Facebook well, the idea was like, like they yeah, just stepped likely, right in it. How likely is Google to sue Facebook for patents on a JavaScript framework on the web when you know Facebook has a whole pile of patents themselves, right? It's like, to me, it's a mutually assured destruction sort of situation. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Right? just like let him be but i, I you know I, you, I don't know if you know this was i was sued for a software patent once i did not know that do you know what my horrendous crime was please do share i used to have an old app and and og listeners of the show will know called code journal on the mac oh yeah i remember and you talking this, about that this app used to pull github uh, pull requests and gist and things like that and it would highlight the code intelligently based on a number of languages. So, for instance, an if statement would be highlighted, right? Like the you know you know how it is uh, in your source control editor, right? Your your text is different color, right? If the word if is a different color, oh yeah, some jackass has a patent on that. Really? And sued me. Oh my! Wow. So how did that how did that go? What happened? Uh, they've never dealt with the crazy person before. Mm -hmm. Many people I said, have. I will file corporate and personal bankruptcy to stop you from collecting money. Wow. Good luck. That's impressive. I said, I will go to court for years to invalidate the past patent. And they said, we're... And then they said, well, how much money does the app make? And they, did, they claimed that they decided it wasn't worth it. That's what they did. I see. That's, that's, the, that's the line they're going to go with. Well, I mean, for them, I mean, a patent trolls want millions, right? Yep. CodeJournal never made a million never dollars. Made, yeah, right. It's funny that you're even getting um, even right. getting targeted with it, really. I, the only reason I got targeted was because it ended up, for like three weeks, it was at the top of its category in the Mac App Store. So I'm sure this troll sued everybody who was in the top ten. Yes, you just pick up, you pick them off, go... Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so... It, it, the, pat, the whole software patent thing, I think that's just... That ought not to exist. And we solved this entire problem. Yeah, right? I mean, it doesn't... Maybe maybe patents work in some industries or at one time, uh, you know, to help innovation, to give people who've innovated some, you know, leverage so that they make sure that they profit enough off their uh, innovations, etc. But when we have... I mean, there's, like, a lot of problems, but certainly we have such, a, such like, that that gets patented and then can be used to stop anyone else from working with it unless they pay exorbitant costs. Right. That just hurts... Who is right. that good for? Certainly not the consumer, certainly not uh, small independent developers. No, I agree. Um, do you have anything else before we wrap this up? Uh, no, you know, uh, well, one thing I would say, I think you're right about um, React Native being a big deal. Uh, I hope that they do, I hope they relicense that as well, because... I see that being, I agree with you in that like, yes, React, but React is kind of like, yeah, everyone knows about it. People, many people have worked with it. Um, but if you can have people who have these React skills and then transfer without having to go also become a, uh, you know, Swift certified 
iOS engineer to make your apps, um, or even if you can just have you know a couple members of your team who know how to write the low-level components you need, and then the rest they can actually orchestrate the business logic. That just seems like a really big win in terms of of human power on your team and absolutely, development costs. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's something that I get hired for all the time. Write these native Objective C components. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, and then if you can just have anyone else be like, yeah, tie it together, get an app out, uh, you know, fix it up for the next release, one and done. Um, from the uh, closure script side, it's it's kind of neat because they um, have a lot of techniques now to do live development. So you sort of bootstrap your React Native um, once from, let's say, an iOS machine or, or from, from your OS X machine onto your iOS device, uh, and then it'll just do hot code reloading. Every time you save in your editor, they connect over WebSockets, and then so you know you can just do that once, have it synced, and then just keep developing against it until, until you're done. You know what that reminds me of, right? I do not. Oh, maybe Smalltalk. Smalltalk! Boom! Yes! yes. Ah, that's beautiful. Hey, um, circle. Full circle. Okay, well, on full circle and small tuck and the excitement of learning about new things, let's also uh, say hi to our other sponsor this evening, which is our friends over at, you've guessed it, Linux Academy. Head on over to linuxacademy.com slash coders. There, oh boy, you will find all the tools you need to bring up your Linux skills. And not just Linux. Maybe you want to get AWS certified. You, uh, you know, your boss is hammering you to learn more AWS. We're all migrating to the cloud tomorrow. What are you going to do? Uh, you could go spin up your own account and pay way too much money because you didn't realize what you're doing and you, you know, have a thousand EC2 instances now. Or go sign up at Linux Academy. It's way simpler. They handle all of that, and you get instructor help is available. They've got incredible courses on just about anything you might want to learn. They're all broken down by time, so you know just how long it's going to take you. The course material, there's a ton of Jupyter Broadcasting members on Linux Academy, so you have you know you have forums, you have ways to discuss, you have ways to ask for help, you have real humans to help you if you need it. They also have a bunch of nuggets. So let's say you're a busy person, because you probably are if you're listening to this fine show. Those nuggets are gold, seriously, because you could just have, you know, you just have a couple minutes of time, you can see how long it's going to take you, and you just learn one concrete thing. Maybe you've never been sure about how user management on Linux works. Boom, nugget for that. Maybe you just want to, you know, understand a little bit better about how objects work in Ruby. There's, there's nuggets for a ton of different things. That's what makes them so useful. You can graduate from the nuggets to their, their full courses. They even have training programs to help you get ready to you know, get your Red Hat certification. Um, the things you can learn on the Linux Academy, it's a huge number, but what really sets them apart is it's not everything, right? You're not going to learn how to crochet. They just That's not something they're going to teach you. They're not going to teach you how to fix your sync. None of these things are Linux Academy's ballgame, and that's because they're really taking the time. They're experts in these industries. They've hired instructors who knew what they're doing, and there's a, there's a shared passion about open source technologies, Linux server technologies. That focus really speaks to what they're trying to do. So if you, if you head over to linuxacademy.com slash coders, you can sign up. You know, One plan, unlimited access. They've also got great team support so you know if you're if you're a manager um you have a team of students maybe you're a senior developer you're looking to have your teams let's say you've just started devops and uh sure you've got some great developers but they really need their week on their ops skills linux academy is perfect for that you can get experience playing on real systems the courseware is customized to the systems you're using you're on CentOS? Okay, it'll be CentOS commands. You're on Ubuntu? It's Ubuntu commands. Whatever your, whatever stack you're using at your office, Linux Academy probably has it and will help you get your get training, get your team trained. The team interface is great. You can see where everyone is. You can make sure that your team is making the progress that you're expected of them. Make sure they're taking making good use of the available resources. It's perfect, and it just shows some of the forward thinking and focus that Linux Academy has. So head on over, linuxacademy.com slash coders. Get started. Learn something cool today. And thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. I'm always learning something new over at Linux Academy. Not small talk yet. They don't have small talk, but uh, maybe if we pressure them, maybe if this re- you know this this renaissance of small talk happens, uh, you know they what? probably will. Adam from Linux Academy and I are LinkedIn friends. I'm going to be pushing to teach that small talk class. Ooh, brilliant, awesome. Well then. Uh, next time on this here show, maybe maybe we'll all be small talk experts. I think that's uh, that's about it for this one. Do you have anything else you want to leave our our wonderful audience with? No, um, I would say let's get ready for round two. If you're live on the the live folks can hear round two, right? Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, 
that's it for this episode of Coder Radio. Thank you all very much. This has been episode 275 for September 29th, 2000. 17. If you'd like to see more, head on over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. There you'll find the archive and go check out all of Mike's wonderful past episodes. Or there's a whole bunch of other awesome JB shows on there, so uh, give some of those a try. I particularly recommend this week, Linux Action News and User Error. Uh, if you want to find more of me, I'm at West Payne. Mr. Dominic, where can they find more of you? Um, at Buccaneer.io and at Dumanuko on Twitter. Beautiful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us here for Coda Radio, and we'll see you next week.